Welcome to the Hunting Beast Podcast, your source for hunting tactics, news, and stories. And now your host, Mario Traficante. Hello and welcome to the second installment to the Hunting Beast Q&A with Dan and Mario. We've got a series of questions that were posted on the forum from some of our members. So I'm just going to go through these and Dan and myself will answer them as best we can. So first one's... First one up is a question from Ghost Hunter. River bottom surrounded by reclaimed farm country, down to the banks in some places, and high knobs full of cedar patches surrounded by private farm country with bean fields and corn. Where to set up from September through January? <laughs> so how do you set up in these areas, Dan, throughout the whole season? Put a picture of it up here and throw a dart. You know, where it lands, you hunt. Uh, you got to break it down. I mean, look at the transitions, look at the uh, points, look at the fingers, look at the little islands of uh, timber out in open areas, and uh, look at the overlooked stuff. I mean, that's a wide open question. I mean, uh, we've got uh, a whole video series I've been working on for years to cover that exact question. That's too wide open. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, if you break it down, let's just look at river bottoms. Okay. So, early season river bottom, how would you hunt it? Okay, river bottom, I'm looking at as either, the, the majority of them I'm looking at as like either farmland or I'm looking at it as timberland. It's either big woods or it's farmland kind of in that bedding uh, scenario. Yeah. Or it's the actual river bottom. So, when I'm looking at river bottom, I'm looking at the shape of the river. That's the only thing that's going to be different from what the rest of the terrain is. So, uh, when I look at the river, I'm looking for oxbows mainly. Um, oxbows create a lot of bedding along rivers. And uh, I've had a lot of action over the years. Some of the biggest bucks I've ever hunted have been in oxbows. So, what an oxbow is, is right here, this is a river. Okay? And this is your, your high land. Um, this is an oxbow. Now, when, if the river bottom is farmland, it's probably going to have a field that goes like this. Whoa! Taking off of me. So, okay, so when, you, when you're going to have deer bedding here is usually when the wind is blowing in some sort of, if, if this was accurate, southerly wind. Okay? The wind's going to blow somehow this way. Might be off that way, might be off this way. So now, if you have this wind here, and he's going to probably be bedded over here. If you have this wind here, going this way, he's going to probably be bedded over here. The straight on wind, he's going to be bedded up there. And he's going to be smelling this mouth, and he's going to be looking across the river for danger, his escape. Uh, now, some of this has to do with how big the river is, how wide it is, how easy it is to cross, those kind of things. Um, Right, that's your escape. I've seen it where it's uh, actually more of a island, and you got a shallow water cross, and those are really good usually. And the best, uh, the best uh, one I've ever had was one done down in Iowa. I hunted one that was just awesome. Every time I ever hunted it, I don't hunt that area no more. But way down in southwestern Iowa, there's a river to come through. And it had an oxbow that was shaped like this. And they would bed up in these areas in here. And this was all field. And I would hunt right here if I had a wind going like this. And, uh, man, they, they would come in with the, into the wind, cross the river, and bed in here. And then in the evening, they would come out past here. Um, but I also had them coming in in the morning where they'd come in like this and swing around a bit and then come into it. But uh, I, I almost killed the biggest buck of my life on that one. Shot him, never recovered him. 
which seems to be an ongoing story lately, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if it's all timber, they'll still bed in those oxbows. Um, so oxbows mainly. Uh, you can also use turns and river during rut. Um, I can think of another spot where I had uh, a river that had like a point in it like this. And then it swung around like this. So this is the river. And this point had all kinds of dough bedding on it. And the timber was like kind of like this. And then there's a uh, little timber line like this. And then timber over here. And these bucks had come across and they'd want to check on these does. So some of them would come kitty corner like this. Some of them come up like this, but they'd run this area. Then they'd go through into this next piece of timber through this little tiny funnel right here. And I'd sit right here and I'd watch all these bucks come check on those does. And then come that way or come like this. Because the river was real deep. But you can use little terrains to um, cause funneling during rut. Terrains are pitch yeah. points that are along that river. I think you're more likely to shoot the mature buck, you know, five or six year old in that oxbow. Yeah. But you're going to see cruisers, rut cruisers, in those type of spots. Everything else in a river bottom like that is going to relate to what terrain it is. It's obviously going to be flat if it's river bottom usually. Then it's going to get into whether it's farmland or it's timber. Yeah. Because you have a water source too, you know, not only are you thinking about wind, but you're probably thinking about thermals as mm -hmm. well. Um, yep. As it relate to it. Other items that he had in here Full of cedar patches, surrounded by private farm country with beans and corn. So if you got cedar patches, if it's low-lying cedar patches with grass, some of that can be pretty, pretty good bedding. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but depending on how big those cedar trees are, it can also be hard to access to hunt. You're right. You but observe it. Yeah. You know. But if you've got, as Dan mentioned, a transition that's between the private farmland and the cedar patches where they're bedding hunt that transition, mm -hmm. you know. So, bean fields, corn fields, September and January, I would say as the season wears on, like we mentioned late season with a corn field or a bean field, it's really gonna matter, is there any any remnants of any of that crop that's left well, in that Well, on, on a corn field or a bean field, what happens in late season is usually they start bedding further back, because they're gonna get bed back and fix stuff. Mm -hmm. But in early season, a lot of time, you'll see deer better right on the edge of a field. Yeah. Now, looking into it, where they got the wind to their back, wind blowing into the field, and they're watching downwind, smelling the timber behind them, where they can't see. Um, but you won't see that as much in late season. You'll see them head back into thicker stuff and travel to the field. Right, right. like we saw, some deer will travel quite a distance to get to those. I, I can't you know. tell you how many times I've had people tell me that the, that they can't understand it, but they got trail cameras up and they're observing, and they see all these deer in this field, shooters, in daylight. But you go in there and hunt, you don't see them. Well, it shouldn't be any big mystery. They obviously know you there. Right. They're seeing you. Yeah. They're seeing you or smelling you, one of the two. Right. It, deer are notorious in croplands for betting on the edge of an open area and watching it. I think a lot of people don't get that. Yeah, I think the other thing I've noticed on in crop fields are there's heavy travel patterns. You know, deer may bed in the corn, but I've seen this too, is where if you have a heavy section of timber, mm -hmm. and I've seen in corn where they'll, they'll have like a, maybe an open strip here, mm -hmm. but then this will be solid corn then they'll have another open strip like here. Mm -hmm. I've seen these these kind of these open areas that are accessing this timber. Like they use this corridor and just be pounded like right on this corner. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And then the deer may they'll go through and hop this other access point where it's like they're shielded in here where that corridor is cut in the corn mm -hmm. where they have those strips. But this this one corner transition was just loaded with tracks. Almost mm -hmm. like it's like a meeting point where the open area is between the corn and... Stanley talks about hunting like that a lot. Um, when you listen to 
Stanley on the website talk. Yeah. And uh, he shoots an awful lot of big bucks, you know, and, and he hunts a lot of those corridors like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, in, in obviously yeah. as... Another thing about farm country is, I mean, you get into farm country, um, a lot of times they're not bedded where people expect them to bed. And you can tell people this until you're blue in the face, but they just keep hunting the same way. I mean, there's one farm by my house. Um, this is fresh in my mind because I've been um, mapping this out and showing the video and stuff for, for the farm video. But there, here's a road that comes through. There's this farmhouse here, right? And uh, this farm gave me permission to hunt their property, and they got this this giant wood lot here and it, this is all farmland around or fields around it the road turns like this and goes off this way and uh, uh, this guy gives permission to every single person that asks every person that knocks on his door and you can't go out there any day and there ain't cars parked and on the weekends it's nuts you know the cars parked all over behind his farm over here over here and people will be hunting this wood lot. And this guy wants to get rid of the deer because he believes they're doing all the damage to his crops. Um, but over here, there's ditches and tree lines um, connecting all these fields, but it's all open fields, right? Now, I've probably seen 10 shooter bucks on this property since I got permission. I have never ever seen or gotten a picture of one in that woodlot. Yeah. Ever. They're always bedding out in these ditches. Right. And that's what people don't get. You'll see deer in here. I've seen deer in here. Lots of deer. But not what I'm after. Not the mature ones. And I've got, I've got video of a deer out here that's over 200 inches. I watched him for three years. I've seen him all summer for three years in a row and I have never ever seen him go in that woodlot or come out of that woodlot or be anywhere near it where the people hunt. He'd come in and out of these fingers, tree lines and stuff. And uh, I, I almost killed that deer. I didn't get him, but I almost didn't. He was well over 200 inches non-typical. And uh, I shined him all the time. He'd always be out in these fields walking around. All the hunters would hunt over here. Yeah. Why? And that's what I'm trying to get across to people and, and uh, addressing that question. You know, why people are struggling in this type of terrain is because they're hunting here. And you hear people go, well, I get in these areas and there's already stands set up. That's because you're hunting here. Yeah. That's, that's your problem. Deer, deer don't frequent areas like that. Mature bucks like to get off on their own in some open area where they know everything that's going around. Who the hell walks through those muddy fields? Especially when you got to cross the the irrigation ditches at each each one of the junctions. Right. Nobody. That's where those deer hang. They don't mind crossing those ditches. They don't want to smell people. All right. On to the next one. This next question is from RD Huge 85. I would like to hear your thoughts on hunting CRP areas surrounded by patches of wooded areas and ag. So kind of similar to this question. For instance, there is an area of public that I hunt that has a large CRP field with a few areas of thick brush. This is surrounded on three sides with wooded areas and a rotation of corn and beans on the other. From what I can tell, the bucks are bedding on the edges of the thick stuff where it meets the tall grass. Would you attempt to ground hunt the CRP or set up where the woods meet the CRP. Ricky, let's break that down. All right, so. Oop. Here's a CRP field at Dave's, Dave's farm, okay? There's a wood lot here, up here. There's a wood lot coming off here. There's a little wood lot here. There's a heavy tree line along this edge. This rotates between corn and beans. This whole area here, right? This is all CRP, this here. Okay. So, where's it? So I see a lot of bedding in this CRP. Um, 
When you're talking about edge bedding, that's a little different than CRP bedding, even though it's in a CRP. And I see that right here, there's a spot where there's a bunch of fallen trees and there's a lot of brush, and I see deer bed there a lot. It's a little different than just CRP bedding because they're bedding there because of the tree line, really. Right. So it's more like tree line bedding. Okay? But when they bed in the CRP, this particular CRP, this right here, is a valley. Valley goes through right here. This is a valley going through here, right? Lowest spot. And the highest spot is up here and here. So there's a little ridge line right here and here. So um, there is a patch right here of willow whips, you know, sapling willow trees. When there's leaves on it, there's always bucks bedding in there. And then the wind direction doesn't matter because they bet on this side when it's going that way, they bet on that side when it's going that way, and, and so forth. So where there's cover in there, where there's a tree growing in the CRP. Just like cattails, you look out at it, you're looking for some port kind of structure, right? Right. So you got structure here. So other than that structure that's in that CRP, what I'm finding is um, most guys would look at that and go, okay, those deer could be anywhere in that CRP, right? No, they're not. This ridge right here, the majority of the bedding is right here when the wind is west. This being west, got to kind of... I rotated it, just in the way I envision it. So when we get the rare east wind, you see them bedding on here. They're bedding leeward. Okay. Even though that ridge is only a 10 or 15 foot um, elevation. It's a relatively flat farm. They're still bedding leeward there. And what's interesting about that is you kind of think, well, maybe it's a fluke. Because there's not much elevation. Elevation is about as much as this room. Right. It's very little. But they're always bedding in that area. So... It's rare they're betting up here because we have rare east winds. Right. But we do get them there when there's an east wind. Um, so the farm lady, Dave, Dave's mom, every now and then she mows this whole thing because she doesn't want to. She doesn't get paid for CRP, but it is CRP. She mows it down and cuts it like grass down to the bare dirt so it doesn't turn into trees. She does this every now and then because she wants to keep that as a field. And. Uh, It'll take a couple of years before it all grows back into thick. Right. But as soon as the grass is high enough, high enough to hide the deer, where do you think those deer come? Right in those spots. Exact same spots. They right. show up in the exact same beds in the exact same locations. That tells me that when they bed in this stuff, they're looking for specific spots to bed. It's not random. Yeah, so you probably, if you're looking at that CRP field that you're talking about, you might want to look at a topo based on Dan's interpretation here to see where there's some rises. On a topo or look out on it and look for the, the, those trees, a little heavier grass, and that creates an edge, a little open spot. And basically when you're looking at, at, at farmland that's kind of semi-open like this, even the wooded sections, think of it like this, highest elevation, lowest elevation. 90% of your bed bedding is going to be in a high elevation or a low elevation. And it's not going to be quite the highest. It's going to be like leeward, like we talk, right? But those high elevations, low elevations. So you look at a tree line like this. The tree line, the lowest spot has bedding in that tree line. The highest spot has bedding in that tree line. There's no bedding anywhere else in that tree line. There's a tree line over here. There's a high spot on it. At that high spot, there's bedding. Highest elevations, lowest elevations. Yeah, patches of wooded areas and ag. Another thing is like the 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 patches of wooded areas, especially if they're transitioning to the patches of ag areas, that I think you could probably scout the entire perimeter of that thing and find Let's where you pull got this your, up once. Okay. You know, you where you've got your access trails coming in and out. Okay, so here's that wood lot in the center of Dave's farm, right? There's a there's a uh, pond in the middle of it here. It goes actually into the neighbors. Okay, um, this over here 
his old pasture in one field right here, crop field from the neighbor. This is crop field. This is a big food plot. There's a little food plot here. There's a food plot here. There's a food plot here. There's a big field over here. This is all that CRP. This is CRP. This is all CRP. So when we get this west wind, a lot of times they bed right on this edge. Watch now. Okay. When we get uh, an east wind or a southeast, they hole up up in here. Um, you get a south wind, a lot of times we get them right here. Um, other than that, they're bedded bed based on here's timber. This is the kind of grass transitioning into the pond. They're bedded on these edges. Bedded on the edges here. So like anything else, you gotta go in there and scout. So they're bedded on transitions and they're bedded on edge looking out. The main thing you gotta remember is all this bedding kind of relates to the same thing. They put their back up against thick, nose to the open, wind come from the back. Yeah. Yes, if you got Here's my gear tonight. I like it? Yeah. <laughs> so this is what Dan's talking about in these bedding scenarios. You know, maybe you've got some, you know, dogwood in here and the situation of those ag fields, those crop fields, maybe you've got a fallen tree. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got timber here, a fallen tree, okay? Maybe you've got buckthorn patches that are coming through here and growing up. Okay, but they usually got thick to their back, mm -hmm. and then you look for that wind coming over the animal. Yep, so and he's looking towards the open downwind. And then if you've got your yeah your ag field down here, he's looking line of sight mm -hmm. down. A big problem on farmland is deer bedding on edge, watching your axis. Yep. It's very very common, and the biggest mistake hunters make on farmland is to always park in the same spot and access the same way. Yeah, that the property my mom used to own, that was a big challenge on that spot. Mm -hmm. Really didn't learn that pattern until later on, but the elevation, because it was in hill country, was just high enough at the apex of the property where as the foliage dropped a little bit, those deer could sit and they, they could watch that access. Think about if you're on that property and you're a soldier, and you had the the enemy coming on that property to get you. Yeah. And occasionally they would come in, and you had to set up your, your camp in there and hide without getting killed. And you could be anywhere on that property, and they could come on at any time and come after you. Where would you set up? Where you can't see where they come on? If they always come on the same way, I'm watching it. Right. I'm going to get across a little valley, and I'm going to watch it, right? Yeah. Those deer setups are smarter than what you think they are. I don't know if you want to call that instinct or, or if they're that smart or what, but they are set up watching that axis. They're looking for you. Right. Sometimes you can get by by walking past and then sneaking back through and setting up someplace else, but you've got to think that they're probably betting to see you. How can you get in there a little different sometimes and hunt from a different way? Or Yeah. Talking to other, a couple other people, you know, stories about farmland and how deer adapt to tractor noise, farm equipment noise. I mean, I heard a couple different stories of during the time when the farmer's pulling crop and he'll have deer in the field coming to pick up the either the bean or the corn scrap that's coming out mm -hmm. there. But those guys talking about having success on mature bucks in those scenarios because they're almost using the farming practices as cover because the deer are used to that. Mm -hmm. They're used to the scent on where the tractor goes or where the farmer goes as they're moving in and out of the fields to farm. Right. And so in that aspect, the deer get accustomed to that pattern. But the moment that you break outside of that pattern, you spook them. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you know that about your you know, the deer and 
the deer that are on your your farm or your property, you can use that to your advantage. Right. The farmer's going out to do something with his tractor, walk out and access the same time that he's doing that. Mm -hmm. Use it as cover. I'm not picking on Ghost Hunter, but it's a pretty wide open question. <laughs> All right, sideways Z. Um, mature bed size. Do you ever measure size of a bed? I'm guessing you would measure the width, the distance from the spine to the gut. Is it more important than length or both? Well, the length is probably the most important thing. However, it's not an easy task to do if you're able to measure a bed and you see that bean shape, because when you look at a, at a at a bed and it's a singular bed, it'll be shaped like a bean. That right. means it'll be like, and that means that that deer, this is his back. Yep. And he's going to be looking this way, and the wind was going like this. That's what that means. Yeah. So, the, the the trick of that is is that you can't measure that. I I mean I don't know what the measurement is. I know when I'm looking at a big bed. But the trick of that is, is that that bed there, um, if it's shaped like that, one of two things. You're looking at a bed that was used once, you're looking at it in snow, or you're looking at a bed that is only used on this wind. One of the two. Either one makes it a hard bed. Um, usually a, a bed that's used on any wind is going to be giant and round, and that's because he's bitten. The bean is right here one day, it's right here one day, it's right here one day, it's right here one day. You see what I'm saying? They, they shift around to the wind. So that makes it hard to measure. Um, generally, when I'm looking for beds, I could give two craps about a measurement. I'm looking for an area that's overlooked. It has about 30, 40 beds in there, maybe even more in a small area of about an acre where he shifts around that area and that there's sign in there of big bucks. I like to see one that's got 40 or 50 beds in it and has giant rubs on the entrances and exits coming in and out. If that's reality in all my setups, no. But that is the type of area where I have a lot of action. Yeah. And now I get into like say Dave's farm because of the low density of deer the primary bed in area does have a lot of beds, but you're hard pressed to find a good row. Even though every time we see a mature deer there, that's where it comes out of. That's where I filmed that uh, the video this year where I wounded that buck. Yeah. Uh, every 90% of the big bucks we've seen on that farm are coming out of that bed in area. Yet try to find a big rub in there. So it's not apples to apples, but it's still an area that has a lot of rubs. Density is going to have, I mean, a lot of beds. The, the rubs are, are non-existent, but uh, that's because of deer density. More deer, more competition for those beds would have those big rubs in it. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's, it's somewhat obviously stated, big bed, big deer, but the shape mm -hmm. of it, you know, like what Dan mm -hmm. said. But I, I would agree that the area and the cluster of the number of beds that are in there is what's going to give you an indication or put you on deer. So case in point, last, at the, it was actually the end of last summer, which is not the time you want to be in mm -hmm. doing scouting, but a buddy of mine asked me to go in and check out his farm and since the, 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 how much pressure he puts on and hunted, he's like, I don't care, I just want to go in and learn some of this, show me where you'd go in and set up. and. Um, I actually didn't get a chance to talk to him until about a week ago, and he told me how the season went. And it was ironic because he was like, well, those exact spots that we walked to, and you said where those bucks are likely going to be, are the exact spots when we did our annual deer drive, but we switched it up on how we drove it, are the exact spots where we bumped these two nights bucks, and they ended up taking one of them. Mm -hmm. And he also in an observation stand that we talked about sitting up on, um, did something that I've never done before. He watched a deer get up in its bed, turn mm -hmm. around and sit back down. Now that deer never ended up walking towards him, but he saw a deer in its bed. Mm -hmm. 
the reason why I picked this up about the comments about betting is because, you know, this is a property that's kind of like this. You have swamp, crop, crop, timber, and crop. And he had a little section over here that was a food plot. So I followed, you know, basically what Dan and I typically do. We, we snuck along the edge of this thing and we dropped down on this first transition. And he had told me everything that he had normally seen in this timber. And there's a lot of buckthorn and stuff that he had grown up in this timber. But we started to follow this timber. What I was interested in when I looked at the aerial map was the transition between the timber and the swamp because it had a lot of these little edges and points that came out. And there was one particular area that humped out like this and then it made this bowl. Okay. Mm. And we got to this point. I was We were finding smaller satellite beds as we walked. I mean, it's late in the summer. Mm -hmm. The foliage is thick. I know we kicked deer going into there. There were fresh beds along this transition. But when we got to this point, what was particularly interesting to me, there was generational rubs that were on that point. Mm -hmm from this point being used over and over and over again yep. for access. Well, so I said, let's hop off into that swamp, and there's dogwood that extended like this. Yeah, this crop field here. We hop into this, about 10 yards off of this point, giant bed. Mm -hmm. Get about 15 more yards into here, giant bed, we both look up. We'd obviously kicked, a, there's a buck, Decent sized buck, he's running across this crop field. Mm -hmm. We could see him. I didn't even bother walking the rest of this. Yep. This dog Don't need transition. To. <laughs> I told him, I said, this bowl was relatively open. Mm -hmm. Now there's a few thick spots right in this transition of this bowl, mm -hmm. but I told him, this whole section right here, after seeing two spots of bedding, is going to hold all your bedding. Yep. Um, he had had a couple bull hunts, you know, due to his schedule or whatnot, but he, he did do that observa observation sh sit up here, and that's where he observed this buck get up embedding right down here. He's like, I think that, he goes, I was sitting in my stand and I looked down in there and I thought, you know, how the branches sometimes, and he goes, I looked, and he goes, yeah, those aren't branches, that's a, those are an at antler deer. And he's like, the bucks must have stood up changed position in his bedding and then laid back down. He watched the, the antlers laid back down mm -hmm. in its bed. Nightfall came, that buck never came to him now. There could be a variety of reasons why thermals might have pulled this scent there. Buck might have knew he was there. Or, or went the crops. Or... Yeah, it went out to the crops. But you know, later in the season when they ended up doing their, their drive, they were actually able to push this little section. They shot one nice buck on there, kicked another one. Um, mm -hmm. So I think this is something year over year where if he plays it right and they don't mm -hmm. pressure it too much, he could shoot a nice buck out of this little section of swamp every single year the way that it's set up. Um, so again. Yeah, I mean, it, like, no, here, kind of like you or me would probably, instead of driving, we'd probably set up a stand right here, stand right here, right, and have a slide into it. But your average guy would set up those stands and know that that's, the real spot where he can really kill a big buck, and how many times would he hunt it? That's the dividing right. thing between me and you and the rest of these people. You start to get this down, and when you only got one farm like this, and you know that those are the two killing positions, you hunt them ten times each. Yeah. That's what kills your farm. Yep. Because then that ain't a good bedding area no more. Right. Yeah, the key is I kept telling, you know, over and over. And the observation. And, yep. Stay Sit back. back. And then just figure out, you know, how is that deer going to travel? If he's got crop over here and they're hitting that food source, well, he's probably going to go over there, you know, versus coming mm -hmm. here. And where do you have doe bedding anywhere in proximity to this? And how are those deer going to start moving during the rut? And you, you could play it. You look at a bedding area like that, too, and one key point of that is, is that bedding area is probably good all year. It's probably primary. But there's also probably a key time frame mm -hmm. when it's the best. And learning that is key on killing those deer because 
your time in it when you move in to make that kill is, is good. But that takes a few seasons. Yeah. It takes some observations. It takes some actual time and stand. And they get camera pictures, you know, up by here by the farmhouse. Mm -hmm. They got cameras in the backyard and stuff. And they get pictures, the night pictures of the really, really dandy bucks. Mm -hmm. And the surrounding properties, you know, have some really, some really mature animals. But, you know, I was pretty excited when I walked into that, that property about how it laid out. And I figured, you know, so it was cool. I think beds, there were definitely giant beds. The first two beds we hit were, were giant, mm -hmm. you know, probably a multi-win situation, how they were bedding off that tip. Yeah. And then as we got into this other stuff, I'm like a combination of, of high swamp grass, fallen timber, and dogwood, like you're going to have, they're going to be bedding all throughout yeah. this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get uh, locked into, is it 50 inches, is it 48 inches, is it 27 inches. Right. I would look at the beds that are in your area and say those real big ones, those are the ones. <laughs> right. You know. That's... And the other thing I notice, you know, you notice about a bed is how well is it used. I find mm -hmm. some beds that you still got pretty significant remnants of that swamp grass that's in there or that mm -hmm. if it's on the, the edge of a slope, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's saplings or you can tell something bedded there, but it's not worn down. Right. You get those scenarios where it's worn to the dirt mm -hmm. on the backside of a tree, or if it is on that transition on that swamp, and all that swamp grass is worn out, it's mm -hmm. gone, something's been bedding there over and over again. Those are like the primary bedding scenarios. Yeah, and, you know, but there's also spots that have uh, a lot of beds that aren't worn out that are still a good bedding area. Yeah. yeah. And those are the ones that guys have a hard time recognizing. And you get a lot of that in certain terrains, like the rolling hills, because they move their bed every day based on the winds and thermals yeah, that's and stuff. A good point. And then try and even, the guy will go, I, I scouted the whole property, there's there's no beds. But I got six big sheds and uh, there's rubs everywhere off these points. <laughs> yeah, there's bed in there. Yeah. But, and then that case, it's got to get a little more scientific because you really got to start thinking about how the thermals travel up the hill, how the wind's blowing over it, how they're using those points mm -hmm. in specific times of the day. Right. And those can be tough to access. Right. So, all right. Next one, T. Greeno. I'd like to know tips for determining the right time to hunt certain bedding areas. I have six bedding areas I consider primary. How to determine when the best time to hunt each one? Terrain, food, location, pressure. Okay, well, that, that's a, a hard question to answer, but I can give some tips on it. Yeah. Um, I can think of, remember that uh, bedding spot where I shot that buck early season that uh, you helped me track? Goes back well, back in the public swamp. Yep. That bedding area is primary and it has good bucks in it all the time. But when I see the giants in there, it's pre rut. And why is that? Do you know? Because there's a doe bedding area adjacent to it. Okay. Um, but that ain't something I just figured out. Because it's near crops, it's in a good hidden spot, and I'll tell you honestly, when I first started hunting there, I just figured they're there all the time. But you give it three sits a year, and one's early, one's rut, one's late, and you find out that that rut has the bigger bucks. I mean, you watch the pattern, what you're killing, and you start to see things, and it comes together. Uh, other spots, you go in there and you know right away. Here's a spot that's got all this bedding off of a point. It's worn into the ground, right? The beds are old; they're not. Don't look like they're being used come come late season when you're scouting it. But they were there. The signs there, the old rubs are there and stuff. And the only thing around there is when you come up that point is is an oak ridge. The island's full of oaks. I guarantee you, the time to be there is when the acorns are dropping. Yeah. You know, and there might be one that's set up for a cornfield or a bean field, or set up for this or set up for that. And you kind of got to look at the terrain. You got to look at what's around. Is your dough bedding? Is your is your food sources? And you take an educated guess. And in hindsight, all it is is a guess, 50-50 at best probably. But you throw three sits at it and find out, right? Yeah. And then through the years, you'll get a really good grasp of it. But you don't want to overhunt it, so it's going to take you a while to figure out. But throw a guess at it. Look at what's going on around it. I mean, it's that simple. Where are the deer coming from? Where are they going to? Why are they there? They're better there because of the cover. 
but there's other things going on around that cover. Primary bedding, they're going to be there all year, but there's going to be peak times when that's the best spot to be. And you don't want to overhunt it. So if you know that, and you hunt like me or you, a lot of these spots, we're only hunting once because we don't want to burn them out. Right. And when you go in there, you want to make sure you're at the best time frame. And a lot of times that's, you know, opening weekend because of a acorn drop, or that's, you know, that uh, peak rut when a does are bedding uh, adjacent. Um, those kind of things. Um, and bedding areas can change, like we touched on earlier, as the season moves on. Yeah. Like they're primary, sure. but, but let's say your foliage starts dropping. There's a change in, in, in that topography, mm -hmm. so they're going to shift. But maybe that's more of an advantage to you because you can actually get closer to them. Right. Because, you know, they're not, they're not betting as tight to that transition. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, throwing a stand at it is probably the absolute best way you can do it. And obviously you want to be cognizant. All right, another one from T. Greeno. How to determine which beds are worth sitting and which ones you just walk past? I'm guessing many of us hunting beds or in bedding areas you would not even take a second look at. Yeah. I think uh, reading on the forum and talking to people, I think most people are stopping paying too much attention to um, singular beds or just one or two beds and they're not real worn in, not a lot of sign, or there's a little sign, not a lot. Um, and really, um, you should be looking for those primary bedding areas. Um, the trouble is, you, most of these guys probably do have to pay a little attention to the lesser ones because they don't have a lot of spots to hunt. They got to spread out their their time. You know, until you build up that uh, inventory, your probably best bet is to probably um, look at uh, which ones you think are the best and just hunt them down. But uh, Seek out those areas that are primary, the areas that got a lot of beds in a small area that are overlooked off to the side. When you look at a property and you break that property down and you say, okay, where does everybody hunt? Where does everybody walk? What is overlooked? I'm not too interested in anything that's going on where it's not overlooked. I want to I want to find the bedding areas where there's a lot of bedding in, in areas where nobody goes. And I think a lot of people want to hunt a property, not hunt deer. And they spread themselves out over a single property. And to me, I mean, you look at the properties we hunt. I mean, we've gone onto uh, entire swamps and scouted entire swamps and said, I ain't hunting anywhere here. I don't like any of this. And we've gone to areas and go, okay, we got one spot we'll hunt in this swamp. Go to the next property, and it's in 600 acres, and there's three spots yeah. that we'd hunt. And... Uh, I think a lot of guys want to have all their hunting in one swamp because it's convenient, it's where they've always went, and they won't get out of their little comfort zone. And I would say you have to you have to spread yourself out, scout a lot of ground, find a lot of bedding, and hunt the best. And I think you should seek out primary bedding. And the reason I have so much action in comparison to most of the people on the beast is because I've been scouting for many years, and I'm hunting primary stuff. And last spring we, we scouted five new spots and out of those five I mean we literally didn't find one area that was like eye-opening to say there was a lot of beds here now did we find singular beds did we find some sign yes but there wasn't that that getting into an area and seeing multiple beds clustered and a lot of these were were highland to swamp transition type beddings but when we went around, you know, these were over 100 acre areas we were looking at, but we just followed the transition lines and scouted those versus trying to take a look at the entire, you know, 100 plus acre area. Mm -hmm. Just follow the transitions and you should... Let's just break break down this year quick. Um, the buck I shot and wounded at Dave's place. If I go back into that bedding area, last time I went in there scouting, there was probably 40 or 50 beds in there. Mm -hmm. um, in a small... A two acre area. Right. Um, the buck that I shot at it and missed by the conservancy, um, if we went back into those, into that uh, area he came out of, I guarantee you there was yeah. 40, 50 beds in there. Um, I could just keep going down the road. I've hunted spots that had lesser beds and had lesser action. But those spots don't have uh, a dozen or more beds in them 
in a tight area like that because nothing beds there. Right. Um, one or two beds is what scares me. And you see a lot of guys say, I found a bed. It's up against a tree. And it's warm to the ground. Okay, something's bedding there. The wind's blowing from that way. It's, it's going to be more worn out than a spot that has 10 beds. But how often is a deer bedding there? See what I'm saying? And the primary bed in areas is what you should really be focusing on. I just don't want to tell people to do that because they're going to run out of spots to hunt and they're going to overhunt that primary. So I would say scout as much as you can, as many areas as you can, cover as much ground as you can, seek out the spots where people don't go, and then hunt down the best spots you've found. All right, next one. Posted by ODH. Question is about season in season scouting and going blind in hill country. Where do I stop and climb a tree? One example, cyber scouting leads me to a likely area. Call it a point off a ridge. To get there I walk the leeward side along the military crest and I begin to see the sign I hope for. Fresh big track, maybe a rub or two, etc. Do I stop, hang a stand? Or do I press on, get closer to the actual point, because that's where I expected the bed to be? Does the sign dictate the logic or assume timing is before rut phases, etc.? No, well, if, it's, if it's me, I'm taking a good guess on where that bedding is ahead of me. I think you've already done that when you were cyber scouting. Yeah. And I'm looking at it from a distance saying, okay, can that deer see me? Can he hear me? Can he smell me? Yeah. And if he can't, I'm going closer. I'm going to go as close as I can without being heard, seen, or smelled, or risking it. And at the point where I think, if I go much further, there's a good chance that deer's going to jump. I'm setting up. And every now and then, you're going to go too close. And you're going to kick them out of there. And you're going to have to live with that. Because if you're not occasionally kicking that deer out of there, you're not getting close enough. Because what's going to happen is when you set up too far back, because you're paranoid about going too close, is that deer is going to get up, start walking towards you, stop at an oak tree and feed, and you're going to wash that thing at 50 yards until it's blackout. And at some point you got to get out of the tree and the whole hunt's blown. Right. You have to push that limit. You have to be as close as you can get to kill that deer. Um, there's some advantages you can have with wind and disadvantages. And if you're looking at that hill, let's just do this here. Okay. This is your point, this is downhill, this is the valley, this is the, the, the hill. And you're coming along that, that, uh, that, uh, military crest. Yeah, military crest, thermal tunnel, and the wind is going to be generally blowing this way, obviously, right? So, if it's blowing exactly that way, I would expect this deer to be out here. So, can you see that as you're, as you're traveling? If it's blowing kind of like this, I would expect him to be over here where he's across the hill from you where you can't see him and he can't see you. Okay, you might get a little closer, but you're going to have a risky wind, right? If it's this wind, I think I would probably come in from up here, actually, and then come in along here and set up some out of sight view and set up somewhere along in here instead of coming along that military crest as he described, right? Mm -hmm. It's all a matter of that mindset of how I look at coming into a a situation, right? You don't want to get seen, smelled, or heard. So it's all a matter of situational wind direction and where you think they're going to be bedded. And, but the whole trick is, to answer his question briefly, is to get as close as you can without entering scent, sight, or smell zone. Plain and simple. Yeah, and in the description that you gave too, you know, you have to somewhat estimate where you think that deer is going to get up and walk to. If he's, if you think he's going to walk on that military crest or that transition line to you, where you first see that sign, mm -hmm. then set up. Because he may, he may make that distance. But if he drops down and heads down the hill, and then it'd be a situation like Dan described, where you're watching him feed 50 yards from you. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, early season's hard because they can, they don't necessarily stay in that military crest. They can go any direction. Right. So having a good uh, knowledge of the area and where they're feeding and what's going on is probably a little better. All right, next one, posted by Stash59. How much or how hard do you look for doe bedding? 
Do you just assume thick and nasty stuff bucks may bet around the edges of will have doe bedding? Or do you go dive in and search to confirm that those are betting in a spot? Just want to clarify. Okay. Um, generally, I am just buck hunting early season. And by the time rut comes around, I pretty much know where all the doe bedding areas are. Um, usually in swamp terrain, they're real close to the buck bedding. And then hill terrain, they usually are too. So it's usually not far. Um, as a matter of fact, sometimes they're, they're together. Um, just that they hold more does and the does bed a little different, a little higher elevation, a little out of the swamp where the bucks get that, got to have those situations where they cover all directions. Does bed a little further out. But they're usually in the same general areas. But I'm not usually out there seeking doe bedding areas, but I do find them when I'm scouting. You do see where they've bedded and you store it in your memory bank for fall if you're out looking at spring, right? Yeah. Or winter. And uh, most, of, uh, most of it is confirmed. Um, what, you, what I think is usually going on usually is, and it's confirmed during the season when you see the does come in and out of those spots. Yeah, I think when you lock down, one of the areas in particular where we had a, a pond that bordered an island that bordered a swamp on the other side, and we located that and noticed that there were a huge concentration of doe beds mm -hmm. on that island in between the pond, in between the swamp. And the bedding that we identified out in the swamp, it was logical that a mature buck could sit in that bedding in the swamp and during a pre-rut or rut phase could mm -hmm. smell the activity of those does bedding on that mm -hmm. island. And then you had the natural border of that pond where nothing could really cross there and there were a couple pinch points where they'd access on and off there. So in that scenario, it's good to put that, to denote that because you know under a certain wind, a buck could be bedding out in that swamp waiting for a doe to come into estrus and then giving chase on that, that island transition. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for that. But I too, I've seen them bed just a little closer up, a little further in, but mm -hmm. in the same general areas. Yeah. As the bucks are, you know, you'll have you'll have doe get up out of out of a good area to bed, and mm -hmm. they'll come to you, and then you know, 45 minutes an hour later during that prime time, you, you can get a mature buck to come out. It's almost like the real good competitive primary bedding is back here, and then you have this secondary or sort of satellite stuff that's out there where the immature stuff mm -hmm. is allowed to bed at, mm -hmm. and then you know. You do see does bedding if this is your transition, maybe on those fringes and things like that. But, hmm. you know, I've had doe walk, see, watch doe walk out of a swamp 100 yards out of, into the cattails and mm -hmm. bed right out there just as you'd see a mature buck. So. Well, one thing that confuses a lot of people on doe bedding versus buck bedding is um, looking at the bedding and knowing it's doe bedding. A lot of people take primary bedding. And because of the number of beds, they think it's doe bedding. And a lot of people take doe bedding and think it's buck bedding because there's rubs near it. Well, the right. rubs are because bucks are coming in their debris. Um, so you're going to see rubs in doe bedding areas. What you're not going to see is those rubs right in the exact bed. When you see a rub right in the bed, where the tree comes out of the bed yeah. and it's rubbed, that deer was bedding there. But uh, what you do see with doe bedding is... That uh, little bean-shaped bed, and they're usually not in the exact same position every time. And they're going to be like this, regardless of the wind. They're going to be better than a circle. This one's looking this way, this one's looking that way, this one's looking at this way. They bet as a group. Now, when a, a doe is alone, and you have one doe, they bed like a buck, and they'll bed in buck bedding areas if there's not a buck there to harass them. Or they'll bed in satellite bedding. But when they're in a groups, and you're looking at those bedding areas in the off-season scouting, you're going to see this formation. And you're going to say, oh, you know, I think this is a buck primary bedding area because there's a rub over here and a rub over here. But what you see with a buck primary bedding area is they're going to have that good background. They're going to be set up to look someplace. They're going to be set up to sit with the wind to their back. And you're going to look at that and you're going to say, okay, he's got the wind here, he's got, he's got an obstacle to his back, he's look, the doe bedding not so much. Right. There's, going to be, there's going to be a spot over here where he could get up against a tree, but it's not. Why? 
Because they're betting as a group. Yeah, they're betting as a group, and they're using the collective group to alert them to danger. And, a, yeah. and an observant hunter should be able to look at this and recognize that this isn't buck betting. It's not betting set up perfect. When you look at a buck bed, bucks bed securely. You look at that and you get in and you're like, okay, how the hell would I get near this thing? You can get near this one. Right. You just can't because of this guy or that guy. Right. Right? Because you got six set of eyes looking at you. They bet as a group. And you, you should be able to see that and read that when you're looking at the betting. If you're not reading and seeing that, you're not taking the time to look at the beds close enough and to think about the wind close enough and to look at the terrain close enough. Yeah. Good point. All right. Next one from that guy. I would really love to see a topic on how to take your cyber scouting skills to the next level. Basically, what are the things that are not obvious to most cyber scouters that you guys key in on? I primarily hunt cattail marshes. Easy for cyber scouting. Tamarack swamps, big woods in northern Wisconsin. I don't hunt hill country, but I'm sure plenty of beasts would be interested in that as well. So really tips on cyber scouting. Yeah, that's a hard one. You said you're good at reading maps. I think... Uh... The biggest tip I would have is that you really got to zoom in and really look close. I think a lot of people uh, stay zoomed back and and don't see things in detail. I mean, looking for trails in those marshes and swamps, you can see them yeah. when you zoom in. You can see, and one of the big tips would be to use the Google Earth program where you can look at uh, history, historical pictures, so that some images won't show trails well. Right. Some will based on timing, and zoom in and look at the trails, and you'll see all the trails spider to one spot. Yeah, there's probably a bed there. Um, swamps are a lot easier to cyber scout than hills. Hills, you're just looking at topos. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta look at the image of the, of the aerial to know where the timber is and how it lays out, because that's not usually too accurate on a, on a topo, where they show the green where it's timbered, right. by the size of the trees and stuff on an aerial. But, in hill country, uh, a topo is your best friend. When you get to the swamps and the, uh, and the marshes, you're really looking for those uh, deer trails. You're looking at uh, points and fingers of timber coming out. You're looking at stuff off to the side that's overlooked. Uh, stuff where there's no parking lots, where there's a clump along the road. Um, you might see a, a road comes along and it's all cattails off the side of the road, but there's just one little clump of crap coming off of there and there's no place to park. That would catch my attention. Yeah. Um, things like that. But uh, the trails in the swamp should tell the most. I mean, if you zoom in and you can't find any trails here, it's one or two. Yeah. I mean, I look for an area where there's spidering trails all over the place. There's something going on there. Yeah. There's some sort of bedding going on there. Um, yeah, the swamp thing, and similar to what I mentioned my buddy's property, if you've got a mainland here, and maybe some mainland here, let's say, and where Dan talked about those trails. Quite often when you zoom in, you can see the discoloration or the change in color where you have that dogwood, mm -hmm. okay? And you've talked about this before, how those deer, the mature bucks, will specifically nav navigate along the fringes of that thick to get to where... There's that hump, that point, that outcropping, and that swamp. And the cool thing about cyber scouting is you can actually zoom in and look for areas like that. You might see this lone cluster. Maybe it's a couple little sections of trees or it's some dogwood out there. You'll see it just out in the middle of this mm -hmm. wasteland of swamp grass or even sometimes cattails. And when you zoom in, you start seeing this. This is what I look for. Yep, if you've got a spot, all the same spot. If you got a spot that's something like that where there's spider webs coming mm -hmm. off, well then I start thinking about wind direction and setup and mm -hmm. how I can access around this. That's what I look for. Mm -hmm. um, look, there's a spot where you've got all this sea of cattails here, right? And there was one lone area where the timber pinched together. 
see your cattails all along this transition, all along this transition, all along here. Where do you think the heavy trail was on that? Yeah. The shortest distance in between the two secure yeah. spots. It was right. There's here. probably some buck crossing trails. Right. Yeah. And it was like everything was filtering down in this pitch point. When you go in there on foot and scout it, this was all cluttered with rubs. Yep. Because of the doe traveling in there. So, you know, you're looking at the edge. You're looking at the, the changes. Little islands, little points, little fingers. And then you're looking for trails to back up what you're seeing. And the topos on the swamps can help for identifying those elevations or high points, maybe where you don't know for sure what kind of cover that is out there, but if you identify some high points with topos out in the swamp, yeah. then deer are probably going to bet in there. They'll bet on those high points, or at least they'll use them to travel. But yeah, the topos, if you get your elevation lines running like this, that's where you can really start to determine, okay, you know, where do I think you know, my military crust that buck might be bettered on a certain wind on this side of the point, or he's on this side of the point. Mm -hmm. And then you can start judging your access, you know, how am I going to, can I come in, how am I going to loop in down on top of him or come across on him. So that's what the top ones are good for. Um, yeah, it's sort of a, you can flip them and do 3D ones too, which that almost allows you, if Google has the high definition maps for the area that you're in, they don't have that everywhere, but you can actually rotate it so you can see a 3D view of it and you can actually look at for some taller trees that are in those areas, which should give you some indication where you can sit. So, um, what is it? What's the one you use? G4 maps and... G4 mapping? Yep. Uh, it's called MappingSupport.com. MappingSupport.com. You've got Google Maps. And then uh, HillMap.com. Hill Map. Hill Map gives you that uh, flip screen. One side's got one map, one side's got the other, and you can set this for topo, terrain, or whatever, and set this for, right. for aerial. Right. Those work. And when you move one, the other one moves at the same time. So that's a good one. It's just that you only got half a screen, so it's kind of smaller. Right. I like the, the MappingSupport.com because one click of a button and it changes the screen and it's the same size in the same spot. Right. You know. um, and typically your county municipalities or any of the different counties, at least in the state of Wisconsin and other states have this, you can log on to those, those county websites and you can get access to the GIS mapping, which is all shows you all the tax information and land inf ownership information. Um, if you if you're accessing areas that are adjacent to private, you want to know who owns something. You can and that a lot of those now have aerial and topo overlay functionality, um, as well as showing you elevation lines and everything like that. So you, I've used those as well too, because they give you land ownership and they give you land borders, which helps, mm -hmm. especially when you're hunting in public that's adjacent to private and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure you're in the right spot. All right, next, next one and the final set of questions here. North Woods, Wisconsin Hunter. Dan, you shoot a buck. You think the shot is good. You are a couple miles back in some thick bedding. Now what? Please explain your next process. Are you concerned about disturbing the area? Will you field dress a deer where you find it? What items will bring you, bring with you to help track? Is there a maximum amount of guys you will allow to come with you? Okay. So I shoot a buck. Um, that's my primary objective going out there. The buck's dead. <coughs> I'm not worried about that area anymore. Yeah, so you're not worried about necessarily disrupting the area anymore. Not at all. Yeah. Um, even if you were coming in there and hunting after me or somebody else, that area is pretty much shot once you shot a buck. Yeah, we've, we've even been if in we this don't situation. find it. Right. Yeah. Um, once you shoot that buck, my primary objective is getting that buck and getting it out of there. If it's shot through the vitals, and I'm pretty sure it's a frontal shot, I'm probably getting right on it. I'm getting down. I'm tracking it. Um, then uh, attempting to find it while I'm back there. Um, 
once I find it, then I might get a crew together to come out and help me get it out. Or I might just start dragging it out. And, you know, got Mario on speed dial. He likes dragging deer. If anybody needs that number, send me a text. I'll forward it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm not worried at all about disturbing the area. Um, as far as tools um, for tracking, um, I generally have a, a small flashlight in my uh, one of my pockets. Um, if... I'm going back and getting help and coming out there. Uh, maybe there's some concerns of getting lost or um, getting misturned and having to walk seven miles out of the area, and you don't want to do that. And some of the places I hunt, that can be a concern, or it can be a concern getting onto a property where I shouldn't be and causing issues. Um, in those cases, and, and in a deer that's marginally hit, I might bring a roll of toilet paper. Toilet paper will dissolve into the soil, and I'll use one sheet at each blood spot and uh, toilet track the deer. And uh, that helps dramatically because uh, you can look back and see the pattern that it was moving. Like you're following it and you kind of get a lost concern of which direction you're going, but you look back at that toilet paper, you can see a direction of travel and go, right. okay, I'm sure he went that way. And you can keep going. And then you can leave, lose or you can leave your last blood and go up and look around and come back and still know where that last blood was. So a toilet sheet on each one of the spots. It helps a lot with marginally hit deer where you, you're not ready to give up yet, but you're going to keep pursuing. Um, that's about it. Otherwise, we find the deer before we start, you know, bringing stuff back. If we got to go back to the truck, we'll come back with a sled to pull it out with. Yeah. Um, yeah, it really depends on the quality of the hit or how good you feel you hit it. If you see the deer fall or mm -hmm. you think you got a good quality hit on it, like Dan said, get on it right away. What we've basically done is in some of those areas far back, we'll back out, take our equipment, our because we're usually packing mm -hmm. it all in, take it out, drop it off of the truck, switch out, get the sled, get the cart mm -hmm. if we want to bring the cart back a certain distance. Yeah. And really, if these are some of your primary spots, this is where you kind of have to have those go-to people that you call, mm -hmm. that you trust, but you know aren't going to maybe take advantage of the information that they're getting by going back to your primary spots. Right. And that could be a tricky thing with hunting. It's a reality of it. Uh, the people that you entrust to go back to these areas that you've scouted and spent a lot of time to, they're going to find out where you hunt. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people say they want to have their equipment with them to pull a deer out, like a drag rope, like this, like that. And if you're back, the distance that, uh, that he was talking about being back, I mean, we've, we've killed deer two miles back on occasions. Um, when you're that far back, um, you're not taking a stand and a deer back out of that woods. Yeah. You're not. So that trip back to the truck is not a big deal. You got to go drop your equipment off anyways because you're not, otherwise you got to go back a, a different day and get your equipment. Yeah. So we got to pack our stuff out anyways. Even if we find the deer, we're field dressing the deer, going back, putting our equipment back, come back out getting the deer. And a lot of times on those trips where we're two miles plus back in a swamp, it's an all-night event. I mean, I might have to work the next day. As a matter of fact, that's been a ritual, hasn't it? Where yeah, I always a... have to work the day after we shoot a deer. I mean, it never happens on a weekend. Right. And it's by the time we get that deer out, packed out, all of our equipment out, it's usually time for me to go to work. I haven't slept all night. Yeah. You know, that's pretty common. Uh, because you do have to take your equipment out first, or you are going to struggle and fight with that stuff on your back. You yeah. know, getting the, that stuff and the deer out. You might as well as just go back. And, you know, I grew up in a time of no cell phones, and thank God for cell phones because I can call somebody and say, hey, I got one down, I'm coming out, I'll meet you at my truck, and it's going to take me a while to get two miles out of that swamp. By the time I get to that truck, my friends are there to help me, and then we can all go back out and get the deer. You know? Yeah, I think this goes through everyone's mind, and part of it is this is part of the whole woodsmanship thing and how much you've actually done it. So being able to navigate your way out of a unfamiliar area mm -hmm. with a compass or just by sign or reading right. the areas without getting confused. Yeah, that's another tool you need for those tools, compass. Yeah, and being honest with yourself, like there are some spots where I, I, you have to laugh at yourself when you're literally trying to walk across a 50-yard section and you it's so thick 
that you get turned around three different times yeah. and everything looks the same. How many times did Dan say, that way, Mario, that way? And yeah. you're like, no, no, this way. Okay, I'll just follow you for a while. <laughs> but it's, it, it's true. There's, you can get turned around very easily. And it I can get turned be, around in there, too. Yeah, it mm -hmm. can be intimidating, and then you're, you know. I swear to God, there's somebody's old thumbtacks in there that are on purpose in a circle because you follow those things and you always end up going yeah. the wrong way. Yeah. So it can be intimidating, I think. But part of that is it's almost like you get it's another thing you got to practice that. You got to practice that going into properties, mm. public areas and sitting till nightfall, you know, yeah. and being able to navigate your way out of there with confidence. I mean, nowadays we've got cell phones, we've got GPSs, we've got, you know, your mobile phone, you can bring up a, yeah. an aerial map to get out. But sometimes it's just if you can read a compass and you can follow your way out on that compass and follow those transitions and you're confident with that, it goes a long way because then you're not worried. You're not worried when it's getting close to that kill time and you're two miles back. You're not worried about how am I going to get this deer out of there. You're just worried about getting the kill shot done and you'll take care of that part of it yeah. afterwards. A lot of guys navigate too with, um, with, with their cell phones. Use a compass in their cell phone. Use this in your cell phone. You got to remember, electronic things can go wrong. They can break. They can get dropped. They can get lost. A backup, uh, actual uh, compass. Compass, yeah. Is something you should have with you, especially if you're in really, really remote areas. Um, you can you can have some situations if you're out there in the dark and you can't find your way back out. Uh, you can run into um, water that's over your head. You can. Yeah. And not, not to say that that's bad, but I mean, you can be bouncing around in circles yeah. out there in that stuff, and especially if it's really cold. But uh, What I've found is when you're in the middle of a swamp and it's a thunderstorm and it's raining, mm -hmm. that it's infinitely harder to navigate around, even if it's a spot you've been in a bunch of times, because everything starts looking the same. You think about that navigating and getting deer out. I mean, uh, when you shot that big 10 pointer two miles back, yep. I mean, it had to be. 10 or 11 o'clock at night in the middle of the dark and we're going out a different way than we never went before and somebody not too far from us fired a rifle yeah fired a gun yeah. i tell you what I lit up like a Christmas tree you never know what's out there <laughs> you know there's some guy out there shooting deer I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face we've done this before too where we'll find the deer we'll field dress it right in the spot where we found it um and then we usually carry an extra flashlight with us and we take some paracord and tie that flashlight up so it's spotlighting the deer. A couple reasons, you know, we've we've laid old jackets over the deer before too. Mm -hmm. Try to keep scent on it, keep the coyotes out of it before we, you know, if, if you're going two miles back and I get two miles back in, it might mm -hmm. be an hour or more before you get back to that deer. Again, spotlight the deer, keep, keep the other predators off of it, but also allow you to, you know, in that case, you know, we could see that, that light from a distance to help you get back to the point of where the deer was. I know it's not deer hunting, but with bear hunting, we were buying those uh, sticks that you snap and they glow. Yeah. And putting one way up in a tree at the entrance when we go in to, to go track a deer, because that type of area, if you get mixed up, you can end up in Ontario someplace or right. you're going the wrong direction. You know, it was, I mean, there was miles and miles and miles between roads. And some of the, what this down has hunts the same type of territory. I know where he's yeah. at. And you in those situations, I mean, have a backup. Right. But uh, a, one of those lit lights over the deer, those brake sticks. I mean, they last like a, almost a whole night. You know, hang one of those up there, or hang it up near your entrance, way up. You know, even if you have to tie a rope to it or a string and throw it up. And we were doing that with the the bear hunting because right. you don't know where that bear is going to go after you shoot it. Where you're going to end up? Right. You know, getting your way out. And that brings up a good point, too. I think if you're going into a remote area where you know there's not many crossing roadways, like you literally have to walk miles and miles, then be smart about what you're packing in. Prepare for the worst-case scenario as if you had to spend the night out there. Now, mm -hmm. you know, most of the time during the regular season, it still may dip down into the 40s or 50s at night. It's going to be cold. you know. So I know if I pack in on a spot far back, it's really easy to bring some, some cotton balls uh, doused in Vaseline and then with a little lighter. If you've got to make a fire or something, Vaseline and cotton balls, you can you can easily make a fire from that and it's pretty simple and it's not a whole lot more to pack in. 
You know, so I always say to myself, you get lost in there, you could likely find your way out during daylight much easier. So worst case scenario, you're spending the night out in the woods. Now, if it's late season <laughs> and it's negative 15 out or it's, you know, even if it's below, it's freezing out 30 degrees, you start getting into situations like that. That's where you want to have backup plans. You want people to know, you know, where you're at. Send them your coordinates. You want to have your phone and a backup plan to that. We were walking out in, in situations where, yeah, if I'm walking a mile back and it's 15 degrees out and something happens, mm -hmm. it's 15 degrees, you don't have much time for someone needs to get to you or you're in some serious trouble, you know, if you're not moving. Mm -hmm. So depending on the time of the year, too, you've got to think about that. Don't assume... You know, guys were talking about that earlier. If you're, if it's cold out and you're packing your warm clothes in, and you're not wearing them because you don't want to get sweated up, and if you are making your way up the tree or down the tree or you slip and fall or something happens on your way out, um, you don't have your cold gear on. You've got a short amount of time, so I think you have to plan for that and know the risk and make sure people know where you are, depending on what time of the year you're hunting or what you're doing. Jeez, Mario, you don't take no risks. How are you going to have any good stories? I'm not saying take no risks. <laughs> I don't want to have that story about how I... Remember that time you froze your leg off? <laughs> yeah. Remember that time when I lost my hand because I was frozen to death out there? That was great. No. <laughs> so, all right. Well, that concluded all the questions that we had on this list. So, we'll post this one out there. Another Hunting Beast Q&A and... Guys, got any more questions? Post them back on the forum. And it was good talking to you. Later. Bye. That concludes today's podcast episode. Please go to thehuntingbeast.com to post any discussions, questions, or comments regarding today's podcast episode.